broke out of this place 30 years ago. <laughs> exactly. It wasn't that long. <laughs> no, it was. <laughs> we, we go back a ways because they're the National Association of Geology Teachers has a program where they give scholarships. And he got the scholarship to come work with this little group on a little island called Fisher Island. And uh, so Lee came to us as a NAGT student, which means we didn't have to pay anything. It was free. But then later he stayed on, and, and he was a GS-5 uh, yeah, geologist yeah. for the USGS for a while. And uh, first thing we discovered, that there wasn't anything he couldn't do. And he could fix everything and did all kinds of things. And probably most important thing is he transitioned us from typewriters to those infernal machines <laughs> that we have to use. <laughs> he was a lot smarter than we were. <laughs> well, my dissertation was the first one on a computer. The, the, the one before mine was typed by a typist. So. Okay, so then uh, he... Uh, well, I heard, I heard stories about uh, Lee, and I promised I wouldn't tell any of the, the bad ones, but... Uh, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> He's got them on But uh, I think one of the most interesting stories, and I reconfirmed it. You all know who Sister Teresa is? M uh, Mother Teresa. Mother, Mother Teresa? Yeah. When he was a kid, Mother Teresa would come to the States and stay at his house with his mother, and he would play the guitar for her when he was taking guitar lessons. And I thought that was <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and as you all know, she's up for sainthood. I don't think Lee's up for sainthood. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I, No miracles there. Yeah. <laughs> no miracles, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then uh, he said he was going to come over to this school, uh, to get his master's, and uh, he came over and just bypassed the master's. He got with Bob Garrels, a very famous person, who was also a friend of James Lovelock in England, and if you can Google him if you want, one of my one of my heroes, uh, who's a biologist, and he was on Lovelock was on his committee. And uh, Lovelock's one of my heroes because in his autobiography he talks about the various tribes. There are the biological tribes and the geological tribes, and he has all tribes of one sort. They're mostly fish tribes here, I think. Anyhow, that's, uh, that's a little background. And uh, so we won't go to anything beyond, we won't tell any of those other stories. Uh, when we were working in the uh, Florida Keys on groundwater, uh, oh, he went to Penn State right away, right after that, and uh, <clears throat> and that was 30 years ago, and he's still there. And when we were working on groundwater in the Florida Keys, he'd bring students down and help us do the drilling and put in the tracers to see which way the groundwater was moving. So we got back together then, and so that's how we know each other for quite a while and there was one other thing he won some award here from this school outstanding is it called outstanding uh, award? Uh, no it's the distinguished alumnus distinguished alumnus yeah. okay all right and so we spent a lot of time working at the keys marine lab which is now run by fo so with all of that background, let me introduce <laughs> Dr. Lee Kump, Penn State. Yeah, great. Uh, Thanks, Gene. <laughs> no, it's great. Actually, you know, part of that skipping over the master's is an important part of the story because my master's thesis was supposed to be with uh, Al Heinen and, and uh, Gene Shin. And in fact, Al had been supporting me for, for a couple of years probably by the time I decided to switch and I actually always always remember that because Al came to me and said listen you don't seem very excited about this project <laughs> and uh, and you've got you know the world's greatest geochemist and you like geochemistry you've got this opportunity why don't you go work with him and I thought you know that was really amazing that somebody you know so I essentially bailed on the project I went down in to Gene's place and impregnated a few more cores and then that was the end of that project and and it's probably still till still orphaned down there at uh, Fisher Island but um, but anyway so that that really had a 
uh, uh, made a big impression upon me in terms of the graciousness of, of Al and Gene with letting me uh, follow a different direction. And, and so I feel bad about putting up a first slide that should sure infuriate Gene, because <laughs> I'm talking about ocean acidification and showing some slides uh, from him of, the, of uh, coral demise in the, in the Florida Keys that I think he, uh, that ocean acidification would be the last thing that he would ever ascribe the, uh, the demise of those corals to. But I really actually show it only because Gene, you know, as you've seen, I've seen the posters around here, had a long series of photographs of various parts of the Florida Keys and looking at the spread of disease and the demise of the reefs that go way back into the 50s. And his wife, Pat, was usually the model for those um, pictures. But, but uh, this summer, I was fortunate enough to go out with, with uh, Gene and Pat on their boat. And, and it was too cold out, and Pat didn't want to go in the water one last time. And so I got to be the uh, model. And so that's me, actually, up there. Not nearly <laughs> as photogenic as, as Pat's been for the uh, photos. So I'm in the 2015, I'm the 2015 model for the series of coral reef demise. Anyway, I thought coming back here, in fact, looking around the room and seeing some of the old faces, reminds me the last time I was standing right here was during my dissertation defense. <laughs> I was uh, sweating even more then than I was now, looking out at some of these same faces. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was actually 30 years ago, almost to the date that I uh, flew up to Penn to State College for my job interview at Penn State. So, so it's uh, great, great to be back here among old friends and, and looking out and seeing how uh, vibrant the department is, especially when you know, we're right at the end of a major national meeting. I'm glad you're all able to be here. Anyway, I'm going to talk about ocean acidification, but from the perspective of um, Earth's deep past and, 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 and explore one possible analog for um, modern ocean acidification that is associated with the Paleocene Eocene boundary 56 million years ago. So since I left here, I really uh, have been focusing more on Earth history and, and uh, looking for you know, to draw upon my oceanographic background from USF, but to apply it to, to the ancient Earth. And um, so I'll give a little bit of background on ocean acidification, you know, probably unnecessary among this crowd especially, but just so we're all on the same page. Of course, you know, what we know is that the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere has been going up uh, for, for the last couple hundred years as a result of fossil fuel burning, the, the famous um, Keeling curve, and that progressive increase in um, carbon dioxide concentrations has had clearly an effect on the climate, but that's a very difficult one to get a strong handle on. What seems to be more obvious, at least from my training here in, in, uh, in, um, in marine chemistry, is that it would have an effect on the chemistry of the surface ocean, because as the ocean takes up carbon dioxide, it um, titrates out the carbonate ion content of seawater, convert the net reaction being the conversion of carbonate ion to bicarbonate. And so, you know, one of the major impacts of ocean acidification is the, uh, is the effect it could potentially have on carbonate producing organisms who depend on the, the availability of carbonate ion for the precipitation of their skeletons. And, you know, this, this also has an observational basis. This is a time series from Hawaii showing this increase in CO2 content of the atmosphere, progressive increase in the PCO2 of the surface waters from Hawaii, um, declining pH, and, uh, and declining saturation state with respect to aragonite, one of the calcium carbonate polymorphs, from 1970 to, to uh, 2014. So it's, uh, you know, it's easy to demonstrate, and it's, and it's intuitive that the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere would cause uh, a decrease in the pH and the carbonate ion content of seawater. Now, the implications of that are a little bit more challenging to, um, to demonstrate. And this is just an old slide um, from, from, from uh, Kleypas and Yates, uh, work of Chris Langdon, looking at the effect from Biosphere 2 uh, experiments of the change, I the effect of the change in saturation state with declining saturation states to the right on um, community calcification from the Biosphere 2 reef. And um, like has been shown in aquaria and other experiments um, um, before and since, there's a, there, in many situations, not all, there's a declining rate of calcification with respect to um, decreasing saturation states of seawater. So the implication is that the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere could pose a, a, a threat to the, to the future of calcifying organisms 
uh, not just coral reefs, of course, but all calcifying organisms. And from an Earth historian's point of view, then, then the question becomes, since most everything that human activity is doing to the planet has been um, uh, foreshadowed through natural events, can we look in, geolo in the geologic record for any indication that there was a time in, in the past when a CO2 buildup in the atmosphere caused an acidification event in the oceans, and what was the implica implications of, of that for, for the marine biota? So we've been working, uh, like many people have, on, on the um, Paleocene-Eocene boundary. This is 56 million years ago, looking for this analog, not just of ocean acidification, but even before that, for, for an episode of, of uh, CO2-driven global warming. And um, the, uh, the Paleocene Eocene event was really uh, first recognized by um, uh, Shackleton and Kennett looking at uh, deep sea cores, uh, calcium carbonate rich cores from the deep sea floor, where they're looking at the isotopic composition of foraminiferal skeletons through time, and, um, and noted that at a, at a period of 55, 56 million years ago, there are a couple samples in there, coarsely sampled cores that seem to have anomalously low delta 18O and low delta 13C carbon, carbonate composi um, uh, compositions. And um, that was followed by uh, work largely by Jim Zakos at Santa Cruz, who really spent the time where people thought it was a waste of time to sample that core at extremely high resolution to pull together a more detailed record. He's done that now um, through a you know, long part of the uh, last 65 million years of the Cenozoic. Uh, he and others have put together a fairly comprehensive record in this case of the oxygen isotopic composition of, of um, benthic foraminifera uh, through, through uh, Earth history. And these are really charting the uh, change in temperature mostly of, of high, high latitude deep water forming regions through time. And you can see there's this progressive cooling that's been well, well known for a long time. What, um, what was of particular interest to this uh, talk is this spike in the um, temperature, which is a drop in the delta 18O of the, of the benthic foraminifera that uh, seemed to suggest a, a fairly significant warming. And, um, and so Zakos, among others, have really dived into that interval and sampled that at high resolution and have uh, demonstrated that that spike is real. It's a um, short global warming uh, episode from, uh, like I say, 56 million years ago. So what, what characterizes the uh, PTM? The, it looks like the average global uh, increase in temperature is about 5 degrees Celsius that there's a range of temperatures from about four degrees in the tropics up to maybe nine degrees of warming at, at, at higher latitudes. There's a large negative carbon isotope that's, that's uh, excursion that's associated with that, and we'll focus on that as what that means, but it tells some really important information that links this global warming episode to, uh, to the carbon cycle. It's an event of about uh, total duration, I don't think there's a slide here on that, of about uh, 150,000 years, uh, rapid onset as you'll see, and then a m much more prolonged, prolonged recovery from, from that event. It, um, it's an interesting event because for the most part it wasn't that disruptive to the, t to the biosphere in the sense that it wasn't a mass extinction event like has occurred at other intervals of Earth history. In, in North America, it, it, it drove a uh, a large mammal migration to, 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 uh, to higher latitudes. Plant biomes and ecosystems in general migrated um, you know, thousands of kilometers northward during, to follow the progressive warming of this event. And that led to mammal diversification. So it's an important event from the point of view of, of, uh, of, uh, of the um, rise of mammals. Um, but really only in terms of a mass extinction event, uh, is it, is it impacting on, on the seafloor? And one thing that's uh, understood about the PTM is that there's widespread dissolution of carbonates on the relatively shallow marine seafloor. And, and that, um, together with evidence for abrupt warming and perhaps low oxygen concentrations on the seafloor, did lead to a mass extinction among benthic foraminifera. So the benthic foraminifera, who had survived the, the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, the, the time period when the dinosaurs went extinct were actually hit very hard at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary. 
And so there's something weird about what's going on on the seafloor. We, we know that the carbonates were being dissolved, um, but there's also uh, sufficient stressors on the benthic foraminifera that there was a widespread extinction of benthic foraminiferal lineages. Anyway, here's some of the record of that. These are um, deep sea cores from Walvis Ridge. Um, so in, and this is in the uh, southern Atlantic off the coast of, of Africa. It's a series of cores that um, Zakos and colleagues uh, collected in, from this area along a transect on, on, on the edge of the ridge. They're trying to track down how much did the uh, saturation horizon within the ocean, the lysocline, and then also the carbonate compensation depth shallow in, in, in response to this, uh, to this event. What they found here in terms of um, increasing depth of the core, these are modern depths. So if you reconstruct, because the seafloor subsides, if you reconstruct the the uh, Paleocene water depths here, something from maybe 1,500 meters water depth down to 3,500 meters or so paleo water depth. A, each of these cores, this is, this is, these are photographs of the cores. You can see this abrupt transition here, which is shown also in the blue lines, a uh, drop in the calcium carbonate content of the sediments there. These are carbonate oozes, so large, uh, you know, high proportions of calcium carbonate prior to the vent, a drop to zero. Um, uh, even in the shallowest environments here, rapid drop to zero. Clearly, there's been dissolution and, by the way, loss of the record. That's one of the problems trying to reconstruct this event by using deep sea sediments uh, in carbonate oozes is that the record itself has been destroyed by the event. Um, and so you see this abrupt drop here that's affecting all, all, all depths along the uh, margins of Walvis Ridge. And then this more gradual recovery in space. We, of course, have to convert this to time to think about the pace, pace of this affair, because sedimentation rates have clearly been varying over this interval of time. The speed the tape recorder has been turning has, has varied through time, and at some points it's been, you know, the tape's been lost and spliced back together. So it's a, it's a disconnected record, but you see this abrupt drop in the um, carbonate content of the deep sea floor, so clearly there was a dissolution, and, and, and the CCD rose above 1,500 meters. Whereas today, typical depths in the Atlantic are more like 4,000 meters, 4 to 5,000 meters. Okay, um, here's one of those isotope records. It's actually one of the older ones, but it's a nice one showing the uh, oxygen and carbon isotope records on the same um, same graph. And so, time going forward now um, to the right, and you see this is the onset. Um, there, most of this part of the record is missing, so it's, it's extrapolated. Um, the, the onset of the vent, a significant warming, here interpreted warming from, from this site of, of about 8 degrees, um, and then uh, and, and, a, and a drop in the delta 13C of the calcium carbonate, and then this, then this recovery over the next few tens of thousands of years. And that's, that's a characteristic shape of this excursion, no matter where you find it. Um, here's just another in, uh, record, um, once again, from Walvis Ridge of the same, same event. These are the carbonate records we saw before put on the same record from shallow to deep water settings. Now trying to uh, convert it into time here from 55 million years ago on this older time scale up to uh, 54.75. And you see the carbon isotope excursion and the oxygen isotope excursion coinciding. So a warming event with clear indications that there was something happening with the carbon isotope composition of seawater. So what was that event? Well, one thing that this tells us, without going into all the details, is that this was an interval of fossil fuel addition. This had to have been an injection of carbon from a sedimentary or long-lived reservoir, long-lived with respect to the duration of, of this event. So this is not just the burning of forests, for example, or a reduction in photosynthetic rates or, or increasing respiration in soils because the carbon that those represent were just recently extracted from, from, the, from the ocean atmosphere system. The fact that this is a prolonged disturbance tells us that the carbon that was released into the atmosphere ocean system came from a reservoir that had been stored for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years before that. So we know that this is a good analog fossil fuel carbon addition. I don't mean, you know, coal oil and natural gas in this case, just old carbon from some source. And it had to have been light, low delta 13C carbon, so it has to have had an organic source, whether it was methane or 
coal or sedimentary carbon. We, we know that it was an organic carbon source. Okay, so people have speculated on what that source might be. There's uh, clear evidence that, that there was contemporaneous volcanism in the North Atlantic um, at, at this time. This is part of the rifting of, of, the, um, uh, of the North Atlantic widespread submarine volcanism and um, explosive volcanism associated with that. The problem with volcanism as a source of the carbon is that the carbon isotopic composition of volcanic CO2 is not that isotopically light. It's you know, minus 5 to minus 7. So to explain that large shift in the ocean atmosphere's delta 13C would require a tremendous amount of carbon, in this case, something like 10,000 petagrams um, or gigatons of carbon or, or more. Um, a, a, a popular explanation is destabilization of methane hydrates from the seafloor, because methane hydrates, this is methane trapped in, in um, ice, cage, ice cages, stable under um, high pressure and low temperature conditions, warming of, of the seafloor um, would, could potentially destabilize the methane hydrates. And so methane hydrate is another potential source. And because methane has such a low delta 13C value, then, um, then the hydrates could, could serve as a significant source of that. And then we had actually proposed this kind of an off-the-cuff comment that I uh, injected into a paper written by a postdoc at the time of mine, Andy Kurtz, now at Boston, uh, Boston University, that maybe the, there, this was an episode of widespread peat and coal oxidation um, because the Paleocene, the, the event, the, the epoch prior to this event uh, is known for widespread coals, especially in the western United States, but also in South America. Widespread peat mires of the late Paleocene, uh, now there's still coal remaining from that time, but, but, um, but that seemed to us to be a, a, a large reservoir of of easily oxidized carbon that might have been involved in this, and it has a more intermediate carbon isotopic composition. So, so the battle still rages as to which of these sources of carbon might have been it. One of the things to emphasize is that um, the, the, the peat fires, the, um, the methane hydrate destabilization, those are responses, those are parts of a positive feedback to some initial trigger of the warming. And there's been a suggestion, of course, like for most major events in Earth history, that maybe it was a cometary impact. Very little evidence in support of that. But the volcanism itself can be thought of as potentially the uh, trigger. So I think the prevailing view at the moment is that there was widespread volcanic eruption.